Hey guys, Tom here from the Investing with Tom YouTube channel. Welcome back to the channel. If you enjoyed today's video, hit like, hit subscribe, and that way you can see future videos as well. So today we're gonna to be doing a Q&A video. Haven't done one of these for a few months, uh, and we've got a whole bunch more questions than last time as well. So hopefully I can get through everything. If I can't, I apologize, I'm gonna do my best. So um, let's get into it. If you want to uh, ask questions for the next Q&A video, drop them down in the comments below. Uh, I also tend to get some off Instagram usually, so if you don't follow me on Instagram, at Investing with Tom, go follow me there. Uh, but let's get into it. So the first question we've got here is from Timothy William. At what stage will Bitcoin start to have an intrinsic value? Um, right, okay, so I've spoken about this a few times and I have done a full video on Bitcoin, but um, basically I think there's two ways that something could have really any value at all. So either one, it, it's productive, so it produces cash or at least something that you can later convert into cash. So maybe it, it's a farm that produces a crop or, or milk or meat or something like that. Um, so I think that that's number one in terms of how you can have an intrinsic value. Um, that, do, that doesn't mean that everything that's non-productive has no intrinsic value. So the other way it can have value is if there's some real world use and demand for that product. So if I um, have that, you know, that, that milk or that meat or whatever from the farm that, that was produced, uh, there's demand for that food. So that gives something its intrinsic value. So to answer your question, unless anything changes with the ability to sort of use Bitcoin in the real world where there's not already something that can do that same job, uh, I don't see Bitcoin having any intrinsic value. So that's my thoughts on that. Uh, DS Krim, I'm sorry if I'm butchering the names here. <laughs> I'm about to start investing in the NZ Top 50. Is there any specific reason why I should use ASB, my current bank, over something like Sharesies? So uh, this is something I've been meaning to do a video on for a long time. I think uh, Sharesies, generally speaking, if you're going to be contributing quite frequently, actually works out a little bit cheaper than using ASB. If you're doing just one big lump sum fund into the New Zealand top 50 and you don't plan to contribute really frequently, uh, do the maths yourself, but ASB may actually work out better because they just have sort of a, a one-off transaction fee rather than uh, shares as sort of monthly subscription type approach. So um, that's the basic formula on that one. But long story short, I think if you are contributing regularly shares is probably is going to work out cheaper actually but uh do your own maths for your own personal situation on that one guys just editing this video uh something i actually forgot to mention when answering this question is that you can actually send money if you want to do it uh really regularly like on a monthly basis you can actually sign up to have smart shares withdraw money directly from your account every month uh and my understanding that there's is that there's no fees that come along with that so there's an initial setup fee um but you can kind of have money contributing to that fund every single month um, and that's probably a more cost effective option than paying like even a sharesies uh, monthly subscription so you might even be better off going with asb for like initially setting up um, contributing monthly through smart shares and then if you know once or twice a year you want to uh, make uh, an investment over and above that uh, doing that directly through asb Again, do your own do your own maths, but that uh, could be an option worth considering uh, for your situation as well. Uh, Henry Michael, hi Tom. I personally use the financial broker on the Comsec website, my online broker. In your opinion, what are the best two or three web free websites providing great and useful financial data on stock market listed companies? What about subscription sites? Any ideas there? Cheers, mate. Thank you, Henry. Um, <clears throat> so. I'm not subscribed to any sort of subscription service to get data. Um, when I'm really looking hard at a company, typically I'm just pulling info from the annual report, um, getting it kind of straight from the horse's mouth. But I do use a couple of different websites reasonably frequently. So Yahoo Finance is the big one. Uh, again, just the free version, not the paid version or anything like that. Uh, that is quite useful just for getting graphs like this where I can see uh, sort of earnings and revenue growth history visually just just to see that um i can get basic you know pe ratios debt levels cash flow levels all those sorts of things um just basic stats i know yahoo finance typically isn't the 
you know, super accurate, but it, it at least allows me to get a feel for what's going on. So Yahoo Finance would be the big one. I sometimes use MSN Money to get things like PE ratio histories for the last five years when I'm doing like valuations. Um, so that would be another one. And I occasionally use the Wall Street Journal if I am looking for year over year kind of equity growth on a financial statement or something like that. Sometimes that does work out easier than going straight to the sort of annual report. So those would be the big ones, uh, but I don't pay for anything uh, at this stage at least. Toby Vaudry, again, hope I'm not portraying that name. Uh, for foreign trading, you recommended Hatch. I've since found that Saxo Bank and Interactive Brokers offer commission-free trading, even for New Zealand people, any reason to continue with Hatch. So uh, I think there's a couple of things just to be aware of with this one. So um, my caveat to this is I've never used Interactive Brokers or one of those ones. Um, but there's basically two ways that brokers make money. Either they charge you a fee when you buy and sell stocks, or with something like a US broker, they charge you uh, a certain amount on the foreign exchange. So I would be looking at uh, you know, although Hatch does charge you a fee, is there some sort of foreign exchange fee when you put money with an interactive broker's account or something like that? That's something I'd look at. Um, perhaps they are comparable and, you know, interactive brokers is looking better, but um, that's the first thing. The second thing is I really like Hatch for um, reasons other than sort of fees directly so i really like hatch because it puts any cash straight into a cash management account um, there's quite a good little online community actually building up with hatch and it also does things like um, really easy tax reporting each year so it'll it'll drop out spreadsheets with history of your all of your trades and that sort of thing to make uh, tax time a lot easier so those are some reasons sort of outside the the little the sort of fee things that that i tend to look at uh, and again, when you compare Hitch to a bank, it's a whole lot, whole lot cheaper. But if you don't really care about that stuff and you're strictly looking at fees, those would be the two things I'd look at would be foreign exchange and the actual uh, trading commission. Uh, next question is from Shizhong Lu. Again, I really hope I'm not butchering these names. Uh, why can't New Zealand have any global sized companies like America and Japan and the EU? That is a really interesting question. I think we've got a couple that are getting close, like the the A2 Milk Company and Fonterra are monstrous companies. Um, they're even big on a world scale. So I think those ones are getting close and that's not massively surprising because we are sort of an agricultural nation and we produce a lot of food that, that needs to be exported. So um, it doesn't surprise me that a lot of companies pop up in that sort of area. Um, in terms of why we don't have larger companies, I mean, the states, uh, if you just look at it statistically, the states has so many multiples more people um, and multiples more money for investment into uh, new ventures and that sort of thing. It really just makes sense mathematically that they would have a lot more larger companies than us. I've even heard stories of companies in Australia that are getting towards the stage of being ready to IPO and actually going to from Australia to the US to actually do the IPO and, and get better exposure to capital. So um, I think there's a there's an element of that built in there as well. And final question from the YouTube community tab, which is the first place I'm looking at here. Uh, Jay Nadler, which low cap stocks on the NZX are you keeping an eye on and why? Uh, I don't like to burst your bubble here, but I'm really not looking at many at all. 90% um, of my stock watch list would be the US, to be honest with you. Um, and I follow a handful of New Zealand companies, but again, the big ones are, are in agriculture, to be perfectly honest, because that's really my core kind of circle of competence. So uh, if you've got any that I should be looking into, let me know. <laughs> but yeah, not, not really looking at anything too closely at the moment in uh, the NZX, uh, especially small cap, which is most of the NZX, to be honest. But um, yeah, to answer your question directly, not looking at too much at the moment, I'm afraid. Okay, so I'm jumping over to my previous Q&A video from a couple of months ago. We do have uh, two questions there. One has actually already been answered around uh, Yahoo Finance Premium, whether I pay for that. And Shizhong Lu, you're going to get a second question here, you lucky fella. <laughs> what about cannabis companies in the US market? Would you invest in them? Uh, so very quickly, 4M analysis, uh, meaning do I understand the business? I've never touched cannabis in my life. A lot of people don't believe that for some reason, but I, I never have. So probably outside my circle of competence and just looking strictly at the valuations, uh, even after a really rough 2019, a lot of those cannabis companies 
are still like eye-wateringly expensive. <laughs> There's a lot of future expectations sort of built in there. Uh, so really not looking too closely at the moment. The other thing is even if it was in my circle of competence, I really don't have any special insights on which company I think is sort of uh, going to be victorious in this, this whole uh, cannabis game. There's so many of them out there and I, I don't know which one would be the winner. It's a little bit like the um, car, car industry probably 100 years ago. No one really had any idea that Ford was, was going to be the winner and 90 plus percent of other car companies ended up going bankrupt. So I think there's probably some comparisons to be had there. So that's my current thoughts. Uh, Nick M, uh, some very helpful videos. It's a bit of a long question, but thank you very much for the feedback from anyone that ever says thank you for making the videos. I really appreciate that. Um, but essentially Nick's question is, are we better off investing in a personal account or are we actually better off for tax reasons setting up uh, a company? This is something I've thought about a lot, but never really looked into too hard. Uh, and I'm so I just can't give tax advice on here, I'm afraid. So uh, even if I could, I, I just don't know the answer, frankly. So if you do ever happen to research this, um, flick me an email or, or drop a comment down below and, and let me know how you get on. Uh, I suspect there's probably not too many benefits, but again, I could be wrong. So if there is, definitely let me know. So those are a couple of questions off YouTube. Finally, we're going to jump over to Instagram and invest in with Tom on Instagram if you haven't got me already. And let's try and get through these ones. So Susanna XO, uh, top money tips in your 20s. I think uh, the money tips in your 20s are basically the same as the money tips at any point in your life. <laughs> like the basics of getting ahead financially are not particularly exciting, but they're, they're essentially this. So save a high proportion of your income, um, put that, those savings into some sort of vehicle that can compound that money and grow it over time. And number three is do that for a long period of time and don't stop. So um, that's that's essentially the money tips that you should, or the money habits that you should really be building in your 20s. Uh, we talk about the time value of money on the channel quite a lot. So money that you invest in your 20s has the potential to grow to a lot larger numbers than money you invest in your 30s or 40s just because it's got longer to grow. So I would say for me in my 20s is save and invest aggressively. That doesn't mean invest in risky things, but in terms of the amount of money that you're putting into investments, be aggressive with that is what I would do. Uh, not financial advice, but that's what I would do and what I am doing. Um, so save aggressively, invest aggressively, and live like a student. Like One of the real powerful things you can do in your 20s is if you live in a crappy little house and you don't spend much money on fancy restaurants and so on, uh, no one's really going to look sideways at you when you're 20 years old or you just got out of university. So take advantage of that. Keep your living costs really, really low uh, and keep them as low as you can for as long as you can. You'll, you'll reap the benefits of that uh, a lot in the future. So those would be my top tips. Uh, Lewis Paz, where would you consider the safest place to start investing internationally and why? So I had to think about this one before the video. I think there's basically two ways I can answer this. So if you want me to take this really literally and just give you the absolute safest thing uh, possible, it would be a short-term T-bill from the US government, I think. Uh, basically two reasons is a T-bill is it's often called the risk-free rate because uh, you're essentially lending money to the US government. And if the US government ever gets into trouble, they have a printing press where they can print money and, and you can still get your cash payments back. So that would be the first thing. Uh, and the reason I say a short term T-bill is obviously the longer period, the, the shorter period of time, sorry, that you choose to be invested, uh, the less chance there is for the government to, to blow apart. So um, for lack of a more technical term. So if I was to take it really literally, that's what I'd be looking at. Um, and that's what Warren Buffett's actually doing a lot of at the moment with just sort of his cash position. He's got it invested in short term T-bills and so on. Uh, so that's what I'd be looking at. If you are looking at the sort of safest thing to hold for an entire investment lifetime, I would be buying like a broad market index fund. So like an, an S&P 500 or a total world index fund or a New Zealand top 50 index fund. 
Uh, in terms of safety, I mean, it is going to have some wild fluctuations um, year to year and potentially even decade to decade. But if you're looking to, to make a bet on something that is going to be larger in 30 or 40 years than it is today and more valuable, I think it's uh, unless we have some enormous world war that, that goes on for a very long time, I think uh, it's going to be difficult to lose on that one. So a couple of different answers for you there. Hopefully that helps. Uh, Jaden D winning. What is your best performing fund of 2018? Well, it's currently 2019. <laughs> um, I can tell you 2018, I actually, um, my returns weren't anything spectacular and I don't think anyone's were really. The SP 500 was down about 6%, I think. Uh, uh, from memory, I'd have to look it up and it's a bit difficult to calculate actually because I, to calculate like an annual rate of return because I'm putting money in quite consistently. It's not like I have a fixed amount at the start of the year and I have a fixed amount at the end of the year. Uh, from memory, I was about even or maybe up one or two percent. So I guess technically I beat the market in 2018, but uh, certainly nothing spectacular last year. Uh, 2019 has been a much better year. So uh, ASX 200 for an entire investment portfolio, 30 years plus, and uh, DC, I'm assuming that stands for dollar cost average. Uh, this is from Jared Barr, by the way. Um, is that a decent approach? Yeah, I think, uh, like I said with Lewis's question, it's it's pretty hard to miss. Uh, Australia's got some interesting things going on because their economy is, the ASX 200, a huge proportion of that since it's a market-weighted index and larger companies get a high percentage of the money in that fund. It's really heavily weighted towards financials and towards resources, so uh, mining and so on. So if you think they're going to do quite well over the next 30 or 40 years, uh, go for it. That's an interesting one, actually, you know, with all the climate change regulations and so on. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll be quite interested to see how that goes in Australia. But um, index funds generally in, in, a, in an economy that you think is going to grow for a very long time, uh, and grow over the very long term. I think, like I said with Lewis, it's it's hard to miss there. So, um, no real comments or anything on on Australia specifically, but I would be, have pretty similar thinking uh, to what I was talking about uh, with some of Lewis's funds. So, that's that one. Uh, ben Jamin, <laughs> fourteen. What are your thoughts on the current media noise around market collapse twenty twenty? Uh, whilst we're clearly at all time highs, would you suggest jumping into an index fund? So with index funds, I think just just buy it consistently. I, I never think you should be jumping in or jumping out of something like that. Um, it's hard enough to predict the, the performance and do a valuation on, on one company, let alone 500 and say an S&P 500. So um, although you can look at broad market uh, valuations like Shiller PE, Wilshire, 5,000 to GDP, all those sorts of things. Um, I would just buy it consistently if that's your strategy and, and don't ever stop. When you're absolutely terrified to keep buying because it's gone down a lot, that's probably the best time to continue buying and probably even buy more aggressively. So um, that's my thoughts there. Uh, sorry, I've actually missed a section of your question. Or holding a cash position and hope for a future sale. So um I think you should always have some cash. I think you can afford to have less cash if you're a newer investor and you, you know, if your annual savings are going to be like 50% of your current portfolio, uh, I don't think there's any reason for you to have a huge amount of cash. If you're 30 years down the track and you, you're you either not working or if you are working and your savings are a very, annual savings are a small percentage of your total portfolio, you can probably be a bit more conservative and, and have more in cash. Um... But yeah, it's interesting. I mean, when you when you look at valuations simply with Shiller PEs and so on, uh, we're through the roof. The, 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 the thing that's really keeping me from saying that these markets are insanely overvalued like a lot of people are is just the fact that interest rates are so low and, and they just keep getting lower in most parts of the world. So that alone makes stocks more attractive. If, if you can get 5% in like a, a risk-free bond, uh, then there's no reason that the stock market should be priced um, at only like a 6 or 7% return. Like if you invert the PE ratio, so if you were, the PE ratio of the market was 20, 1 over 20 is 5%, so we're, we're at like a 5% return plus growth. Um, and that, that multiple would be extreme, I think, if interest rates were at 5%. 
Whereas if you're only getting like one or two percent on a T-bill, a five percent kind of overall market return actually looks quite attractive. So that's my only thing that's really stopped me from saying these markets are insane. Um, so I don't know if that was helpful or not, but that's kind of where my thinking's at at the moment. Uh, Victoria Hamlin, what's it like being an influencer? <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I've ever influenced anyone to do anything, but... Hey guys, video editor Tom here again. Um, I thought I'd done really well and answered every single question you guys asked me, but I just realized I had missed one. So uh, I'll put up the screenshot here. Abhishek is asking about how do we know if an IPO is good to invest in. Uh, my only piece of advice here really is don't treat an IPO any different from investing in any other company. Uh, don't treat it as something magically different thing just because it's first going public. Um, go through your usual analysis. Do you understand the business? Does it have a competitive advantage? Uh, does it have good management? And is it cheap? So um, usually the the valuation part is where you'll really struggle with an IPO. Often you'll have not a huge amount of data to look at what its sort of historic growth rates are like because they tend to be newer companies. Uh, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes they are more mature companies and sometimes you can make pretty good estimates on uh, what they're going to be looking like in the future and therefore what they're worth. So, so that's what I'd say. Uh, the other thing is companies tend to go public in really uh, sort of prosperous kind of market conditions. They'll go public when prices are really high. There's a lot of good news around the company. They've had quite a successful last couple of quarters and so on. So you'll often struggle to get deals even if you can come to a reasonable idea of what it's intrinsically worth. Uh, but those are my two cents. So I hope uh, that helps. Um, Lomax imagery, do you have any suggestions on investing your KiwiSaver in funds or leaving it as is? So I did a video on KiwiSaver, uh, basically, long story short, I've recently moved over to Simplicity. They have relatively aggressive exposure to stocks and they have very low fees, so um, not sponsored or anything, but that, that's where I'm at and you can go watch that video if you like. Uh, Ollie Brunton, can you create a Discord for the community? It would lar largely benefit you and your viewers, smiley face. Um, something I've never really thought about. I mean, I'm pretty good usually. Um, I hope this has been your experience as well, but I'm usually pretty good at getting back to people in comments. And if you send me a message on Instagram or whatever, I'm usually pretty good at getting back. So, um, if you've got questions, like message me there or we can do these types of videos. But I think if we continue growing, I, that's certainly something I'd look into. And if you really did want to, um, build a, you know, a, a smaller kind of community where you can chat with me more directly i'm open to that um again I, I don't know if i've quite got the scale to really dive um full steam ahead into that uh, just at this point but yeah if you're interested in that definitely let me know and I'll, I'll keep that in mind so that's all the questions for today um that was a bit of a long video i think but i tried to race through them so hope you enjoyed it uh if you did hit like hit subscribe Drop any questions for next time down below and uh, we will get to them next time around. So have a great day. Cheers.